Business Dictionary says that servant leadership stresses the importance of the role that a leader plays as the steward of resources of a business or an other organization and teaches leaders to serve others while still achieving the goals of the business. In, in very simple terms, the concept of servant leadership takes the corporate hierarchy, the pyramid of the corporation and flips it upside down. The idea is that leaders of organizations are called to serve the people that they are privileged to lead. It's a flip in the mindset of a leader of an organization, of a team, of a group, and so on. So where does it come from? Servant leadership as a concept has been around as long as people have been around to record ideas about how to lead people. One example, 600 BC, Lao Tzu said, the greatest leader forgets himself and attends to the development of others. This is a core principle of servant leadership is that we are attending to the development of others. In 375 BC, this philosopher said the leader, the word used at the time was king, the leader shall consider as good, not what pleases himself, but what pleases his subject. So you see the understanding of the shift in the perspective of the leader. In Christian thought, we look to first century AD to Jesus of Nazareth, and the parables uh, of, of the uh, disciples in, in Matthew. And we saw the story where Jesus was noted as washing the feet of his disciples and the disciples got bent out of shape. They said, you are the greatest among us. Why are you washing our feet? And Jesus was, was quoted as saying, the greatest among you shall be your servant. And that he who wishes to lead must first learn to serve. So the concept is there. And then finally, in Islam, the Prophet Muhammad is said to have said, each of you is a shepherd, and each of you is responsible for his flock. The emir, the ruler who is over the people, is a shepherd and is responsible for his flock. Now, let me put a caveat here. I'm not an expert on Islam. And I understand uh, that we have to be careful for quoting things out of context. And so if this is not exactly correct, uh, I ask for a little bit of forgiveness there. But uh, at the end of the presentation, I've given you the source, the uh, academic study uh, from which I drew this. And, uh, I, and I leave it there for you to consider. The idea here, though, is still sound, that we as leaders are, in a sense, the shepherd of the flock we are privileged to lead. If we lead them well, with an eye toward their well-being and their growth, we then become an outstanding shepherd. And then there's the golden rule. Uh, this, is, this is one that comes up a lot of times in discussions of servant leadership. In Christianity, we would say, do unto others as you would have others do unto you. And then there are some other examples of golden rule from, from other uh, philosophies and, and cultures. So here we begin to see the power of servant leadership. In the United States, servant leadership is credited, the, the concept and the pairing of the word servant leadership is credited to Robert K. Greenleaf. He wrote uh, some pamphlets, and I'll show you those in a minute in the slide. But he came up with this idea that the servant leader is servant first, and it begins with a natural feeling that one wants to serve, to serve first. Now, this is an important concept, and I'll come back to this a couple of times. But let's look at Greenleaf. 
He had spent 38 years at AT AT&T, which at the time was the largest uh, telecommunications company in the United States. And he spent his time in management, training and development. He looked around at what was going on in, in Western society in the 60s and 70s. And he said, and particularly the way businesses were being run. And he said, no, this is wrong. He says, we are not top down in our organizations. We must serve from the bottom up. We must make sure that the people in our organizations get their needs met. And so he came up with this idea of the servant as leader. And it was published in 1970 in a a short pamphlet. It's only about 30 pages long, very dense writing. And he came up with this concept of servant leadership. And the concept has grown exponentially since 1970 as, as research has developed the concept. Now, he he got the story, uh, the inspiration by reading Herman Hesse's novel, uh, uh, Journey to the East in the 60s. Uh, I I would not recommend you reading Herman Hesse unless you happen to like uh, Herman Hesse. It's a difficult story to read. Uh, But it does talk about how in that in that story, which is a mythical story, how people are traveling and, and suddenly the, the one who was serving them, as it turns out in the story, happened to be the leader of a great movement. And, and uh, Greenleaf, uh, who was a Quaker, uh, a Christian Quaker, read this and said, this is a powerful concept. And so he wrote The Servant as Leader. From that book, we see Greenleaf's definition of servant leader, and it's here. Servant leader is servant first. It begins with a natural feeling that one wants to serve, to serve first. Then, and this is very important. Let me break this down for you just a little bit. Then conscious choice brings one to aspire to lead. Do you see what's different here? One does not begin by aspiring to lead. One begins by aspiring to serve and serve first. And then by serving, by making other people better people as a result of that relationship, people then confer the title of leader on this person. This is sharply different from someone who aspires to be a leader first. And then Greenleaf went on to say, the best test of servant leadership And the one that is the most difficult to administer is this. If as a result of your leadership, do the persons being served grow as persons? Do they, while you're serving them, while you're serving them as their leader, do they become healthier, wiser, freer, more autonomous, and more likely themselves? to become servant leaders. You see what we're doing here? If we're leading as servants and we do it well, it inspires others to do what you are modeling and become servant leaders themselves. And then finally he said, and what is the effect on the least privileged in society? Will they benefit or at least not be further deprived? This is the hard piece of servant leadership. And and when we talk about this in organizations, we have to ask ourselves, if as a result of what I'm about to do, is everyone in the organization being served? And if not, why not? What can I do to serve the least person in this organization or at least not be harmed? 